Welcome to the Lionhearted Dental Podcast, where courage meets purpose, and every conversation is an opportunity to inspire and ignite the lion within all of us. I'm Dr. Steve Rasner, your host, and tonight we have a very special guest. His name, Dr. Steve Rasner. That's right, I'm interviewing myself tonight, and I have a lot of information I want to share with all of you. Dr. Rasner, what do you think the greatest challenge is today versus practicing five years ago or even further in running a dental practice? Without a doubt, the greatest challenge to me practicing today versus several years ago is getting the team to buy. And when I say team, I mean everyone. I mean your front desk team. I mean the hygiene team, the cl clinical team, the doctors they may work with you as associates to buy into systems that you believe in, that are part of your brand, that and then get consistency of a of a product of those systems that you implement. Without a doubt, that's the hardest thing I run into. So let me let me elucidate that. I'm talking about, you know, you may heard me, Steve Rasner say. This is how we ought to start the day every day, okay? So, or another doctor that you follow, and or how you're gonna handle emergencies, right? We could go on and on. When I say that, the patient that calls on a Monday morning that's got a crown out, right? What, you know, what's your protocol? How do you do that? And I've taught for years, the very first thing you do when a patient calls with a crown out is check the lab to see if the crown's there. You know, the worst that you could ever do for office morale or for your personal morale is put a temporary back in on a patient whose crown is in the lab because nobody followed a protocol. There are so many things that run your office that all of us implement during a calendar year or a couple years that create the evolution of your practice. So here's what gets me. Here's the challenge. You think that everybody has bought into that and that it's a thing. You know, everybody knows that the morning meeting is every day, 20 minutes before you start patients. Everybody knows this is the protocol, as I just alluded to, that we use when a crown is out or whatever it is. There's a myriad of, of a pay, an out-of-town patient, right? An out-of-town patient calls with a, to make a recall appointment. The very first thing we do is ask, are there any issues that you need the doctor to take a look at? Why do we do that? Because the easiest way to lose an out-of-town patient is not be able to address the issue that they called you with. At, you know, Maybe it's not a raging issue. Maybe they just wanted bleach traits. Or maybe they lost a something as simple as a filling on a tooth that they just drove two hours to get their checkup, examination, recall visit. But while they're there for a four hour round trip, they want the filling address. I get that. Well, let me tell you something. In a successful practice, everything you do counts, including teaching your front desk team to ask, first of all, to realize that that's an out of town patient that called. When I say out of town, we have patients, like I'm sure many of you do, I'm not mean 30 minutes away, I mean three states away, that think enough of us that they are coming still 10 years after they moved. Three states away, for God's sakes. I wouldn't even travel to see me that far. Okay, You know, that's just me. But I have a lot of patients that would, and so do you. And you want to lose those patients? Everything counts, even something as munitia as realizing that, uh, oh, this is an out-of-town patient. I'm talking about your front desk confirmation team, right? They're, they're making that confirmation appointment for next Monday. Well, guess what? They can't forget. They've got to remember, is there anything specifically going on that you might want us to address while you're here? Because we know you come a long way. That is how you put it all together. That is part where you'll hear me sometimes say, of being 
the symphony of a together practice that's synchronized from top to bottom. And trust me, it's not always like that. We drop the ball, you know, but you have to have something to go by. So there's something to go by is protocols. I learned protocols from the Four Seasons Hotel chain 30 years ago. I did. I was amazed and enamored at how they do things because they're always so together. And it's rare that if you go into such a five-star resort that they drop the ball. And guess what? They have protocols when they drop balls. So they already, they and you know how they do that? With constant strategizing as a team. Because they know not everybody wants to pay per night what it costs to stay at a five-star resort. And look, I don't care whether you're into that or not. You personally that are watching this podcast this week, that's not the point. The point is that if you want to be the five-star dental practice in your community to go to, it's a lot of work and effort that you have to work for to get people on a, on a consistent level to be willing to go out of network, pay more out of their pocket, for your not only for your valued clinical services, doctor, that you and I both constantly uh, aspire to, that we take CE to get to that level nonstop. It's everything, including your front test team asking an out-of-town patient if they have anything they want us to address. So when you ask me what the biggest challenge is, Dr. Reznor, for practicing today, I find it harder to make, to, for the team to maintain uh, focus on things that I think are important, no matter how many times I, no pun intended, drill them in everybody's head. That's the truth. I'm having some fun tonight on this week's podcast because as all of you know, I did this format of a podcast, not as good photography or videography, not as good audio for many years. And you still listen to me in my dimly lidded kitchen. I remember and I appreciate it. But, you know, this week I wanted to dial back because I know a lot of you really enjoyed me coming on weekly and telling you the stuff that I deal with, the stuff that I accomplish, the stuff I fail on, all of it. And it's kind of, and this won't be the last time I do this format, by the way. It's just better audio and and better visual. And while we're at it, I also want to acknowledge that I, I'm aware that I'm way more present in a lot of your lives these days uh, in Instagram and, and even Facebook with reels and things like that. And I, I almost feel like I need to explain to you how it happened because I'm very grateful that it happened because quite honestly, I never thought as many of you would start following me as you have. I mean, it's a lot. It's over 20,000 now. And, you know, I didn't even have that in my my thought process when this started. It started with my March 8th, 9th extraction course. And typically what we did before then is uh, some of the staff members would walk around with their uh, iPhones and take video. And we would throw that on Facebook and Instagram. And I just took a chance and I wanted to step it up. So I honestly, this is how it happened. And I had Michelle enter, uh, look up videographers in Vineland, New Jersey, which is where this is all happens from. And I was just lucky. because and Michelle is pretty good at this too. And she had four or five guys. She called them all. And one sounded better to her. And he's the guy behind the camera right now, Tony Rivera. And so I didn't say, hey, Tony, come to the uh, course and do your Instagram thing with me because I didn't even know that was a thing he did. And he came in, and he, as you know, many of you now, he started firing off these reels, this is back in March, that captured my professional life and sometimes my personal life in ways I never thought about. And it kind of has caught on or caught on. Look, I don't have a million followers. I won't never have anything close to that. It's not even my goal. My goal remains the same, to get in front of people, like-minded 
professionals, whether you're a dentist or not, and share with you things that I've discovered, things that I've learned from being in dental practice 44 years, from being in business 44 years. And that's what this is about. That's how I got to this point. And quite honestly, it's the essence of this podcast tonight. And I'm going to continue with it right now. So one question that I would ask myself now that I'm back talking to you, even though I'm interviewing Steve Rasner, is when it comes to Kate's presentation, what's the single greatest tool I've ever used? So in other words, I have a pretty good track record of patients saying yes to my recommendations. What's the greatest tool I've ever used for that? And here's the answer. It's easy. It's not, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not some amazing 3D hologram, if that's even a thing that they have, video that spirals around in slow motion and shows patients what an all-on case is or what implants are or what anything is. It's none of that. The best thing I've ever discovered and learned was to be trustworthy to that patient, confident in my recommendations, and confident in my ability to provide the service that I'm talking about. That's it. And I got to tell you something. It's not coincidental that that's a big part of my talk early on. I mean, do you guys ever stop and think about it? I have. Think about this. So this new patient comes into your world, in your office. They got there by picking up the phone one day and calling your office. So why did that happen? And who, who decides to call you? Well, that's called branding, right? Marketing. If you're the type of office that markets, like I once did, emergency care. Like I used to advertise an appointment the same day. That was literally a campaign I put in hard copy. I didn't put it on social media back then because there wasn't social media. But I would put on an appointment today. And, and I, I did that with good intention because I noticed from my first 10 years of practice that a lot of the new patients I would get and that you get are because they could not get in to the regular dentist. So that's one way we get new patients, right? So I thought I would promote that. The problem with that is that you get a lot of emergency care patients that are only interested in emergency care. And as you know by now from watching The Lionhearted, that is not a way to build a quality practice. It's not a way for you to feel fulfilled as an accomplished clinician because you do emergency care all day. You extract teeth. You do a pulpotomy or a root canal. That's just not the road I would advise you to go down. But I want to get back to you thinking about what I started to say. Think about this. So on your schedule next week or tomorrow is this new patient exam. And this patient had 20 other dentists they could call. They decided to call you, right? And very, in my opinion, the chances and likelihood that they went to an insurance-driven practice and not a fee-for-service practice is very high because there's not many more insurance practices than there are fee-for-service. So for me personally, I never get over the fact that when I have a new patient on my, on my schedule and that I'm scheduled to see at 1 o'clock in the afternoon or whenever it is, it is a big deal to me. It is. I don't just think about it at 1.58, two minutes before I walk in that room. I'm asking the front desk to be prepared at five of the hour that you guys know there's a new patient coming. I want the office to look immaculate, which I expect it to look that way, whether we have a new patient or not. But I remind everybody, I do it in the morning meeting. I do it 10 minutes before the hour very often. I want it to feel palpably different to this patient when they walk in that front door. That this place is different. This place feels better from the get-go, from what they visually see when they walk through my front door. 
to how it feels to them in terms of warmth and how much value they feel from the front desk team that gets to see them before I do, right? If they think about what I'm saying, if you think it's just a bunch of words, if they enter my office and someone hands them a chart, if that's the way we do things, and they sit down and fill out that chart for the next 15, 20 minutes, and there's no other interaction between my front desk team and that new patient, is that any different than they can get just about anywhere? No, it's not. So that is why everything matters to me. It does. And and that certainly includes me when I've Everything that happens before me, and then when it's my turn, and it's not hard for me to do this because, number one, I like people. It shouldn't be hard for you to do it either. And when I walk in the room, I know that I, that I want them to feel comfortable. I don't want them to think that I'm there to talk them into anything, to sell them anything, because that could, could be any further from my brain waves. It's not. So... I walk in, I usually, the first thing out of my mouth is, hey, I'm Doc, Doc Rasner. A lot of times I say Doc on purpose because it feels country. I mean it. And I am that kind of guy. And I went and I say, so how did you find us? It's almost always the first thing I say. And then the next thing I say is I want them to know what this office believes and what I believe in. And how I phrase that and frame that is like this. I'll walk and I'll say, listen, I did it today, by the way. I did. I said, tell me if you don't mind, and I'll tell you in a few minutes why I'm asking you this. What did you do in your life for a uh, profession? And they'll tell me. The guy today told me he was in uh, biologics, like uh, engineering. Like he was really a brainiac, right? It doesn't matter what they tell me. They could say nurse, cop, lawyer, teacher. I'm going to say, great, because I want to relate to you why I asked you that question, right? I don't want them to think I'm asking them what they do because I want to know what kind of potential income they have. So I say to them, great, I'll tell you why I asked you that. I said, whether you are a teacher, cop, lawyer, dentist, we're all not 100% into what we've chosen as a profession. We can be half in and still go through life that way, right? You can go through your whole career and like your, your job, but you don't have to love it. And I say, that is certainly true. If it, that is, And I'll say, that is certainly true in the dental profession. It is very, very easy to get burned out in this profession for a lot of good reasons. And if you go to a dentist that's in that realm, number one, you may not know that because you can be an average dentist with a million dollar personality and go to that dentist for years and years and get average care. Why? How, how do we get away with that? Because a lot of the pathology and a lot of things that dentists end up treating do not have symptoms. I wish they did because everybody would have a healthier mouth, but they don't. Early gum disease does not usually have symptoms other than bleeding gums. You don't have loose teeth in the beginning of gum disease or drifting teeth that a patient can finally recognize, oh, something's wrong here. Cavities often don't hurt. Even periapical abscesses that require root canal removal of the tooth, they don't have to hurt. And patients don't know this. Okay, so as the dentist, it is incumbent upon us to do, number one, comprehensive exams and let the patient decide what they want to do. Our job is to be accurate and tell them what we have found, even though that's not exactly why they came to us. Nobody comes to the dentist and asks, I get it. Nobody comes to the dentist and asks for a comprehensive exam. It's your job to believe in that and your job to know that leads to the best oral health care for that patient and my job. So one of the very first things that I tell a patient after we get acquainted and I ask how they knew about us, and by the way, the whole time that we're having this conversation, 
I would say seven out of 10 times, sitting in a chair next to them, a nice comfy, a nice comfy portable chair is the significant other of that patient. And that is on purpose. For Absolutely, you should have the significant other at that visit. Why? Because in my opinion, if you do a comprehensive exam, you are going to talk about things most likely that that patient hasn't heard before. And it is better for the patient. It's better for you, for somebody else that's significant in their lives to hear you, to feel your personality, to make sure that you're not digging in their pocket or looking for work to do. Can we just call it the way, the way it is, the way we don't want it to come off as? And the best way to come across authentic is to have two people hear you, not one. I'll often put it like this. When I say to them, so a lot of people are 50% into their jobs, whether it be a teacher, lawyer, cop, or dentist, okay? I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that when he became a dentist, felt like he was an astronaut. Like, I know it sounds corny, but I couldn't have been more excited that I had the license to practice dentistry. And what I did, and it's just the truth, and I know it's the truth for many of you, and if it is, you should share that passion because that's what we're talking about right now. Because that's what we're talking about right now. We're talking about passion for the job of dentistry, which this patient came into you for services for, right? Who wouldn't like to hear that their cardiologist, that their lawyer, whoever it is that a patient, that a person went for services isn't unbelievably into that profession? Who doesn't want to hear that? I mean, I'm not asking you to make up, uh, fabricate stories. I'm telling you, I believe the most people that listen to the Lionhearted are just like me and very much into what they do. Well, you should share that passion. And all I say is, so from the beginning, I began to train, 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 train. It was a lot harder in 1980 before the internet, but as the internet started to develop in the mid late eighties, it became very easy to find curriculums and uh, courses that went on, not just for a day, but days, weeks, months, even years. And so they're hearing me say that. Then I say this. I say the other side of that coin. It's exactly what I say. I say the other side of that coin, and I want to be, and I'm saying this to the patient, and I'm going to be very careful when I phrase this to you. As I'm looking at the patient, this is what I'm thinking and saying. From a business point of view, I don't care whether you accept my recommendations or not. Only as a dentist that wants best for you, I care about you accepting whatever recommendations I come up with today. I never walk into a room and think to myself, ooh, I hope they need a lot of work. No, I'm never thinking that. You know why? Because when you treatment plan earnestly what a patient actually needs, not try to talk every fifth patient into veneers, not try to talk, oh, this patient into this replacement of this tooth or that tooth that may have been missing for 10 years plus. I don't mean that. I mean doing diligence to examining five areas of their mouth, you know, and for me, those areas are always, number one, the health of their gingival tissues or periodontal health. Number two, every tooth in their mouth. I Listen, there's so many stories that I branch out to depending on the patient that I'm talking to. So what sometimes I'll say, I notice that you have uh, three root canals in your mouth, a history of three root canals. And whenever I see that, it always makes me realize the value. And I'm not sure you feel it yet, Mrs. Smith, but I want you to. Like all those root canals you had didn't start out as root canals one day. They started out as a cavity that you or the doctor allowed to get bigger and bigger and bigger until it became symptomatic, until that cavity was in your nerve. Because at one point, it wasn't in your nerve. And you wouldn't have needed the root canal or the crown, or all the work you ended up with. And when you talk like that, 
when a patient can feel that that is really your philosophy of care, less is best for patients, guess what happens? You're never not busy. I'm serious. I said it to a patient today. I said exactly what I just said to you to a patient earlier today. And I said I followed it by saying this. I said, because over a course of a week or a month or whatever the new patient flow is in my office, there's always somebody out there that it is too late, that they do need a lot of work. And I don't have the luxury of scaling it down. They do, if they want to keep their teeth, they're going to need multiple endodontic therapy or they need multiple teeth removed and they have to have some type of tooth replacement. They're at a stage that, that you're not at. And that is the wisdom of finding oral disease early in the process. And you should be proud of that, doctor, that you embrace that because that is the best road for all patients. You don't ever have to walk into a room and hope they need a lot if that's your philosophy of care because there's always going to be somebody that's past the point that you can be conservative. In fact, I've heard myself say lately, because I've ran into a number of patients that, look, in the course of a year, right, we all run into patients that, not many, that just want the best no matter what. Their pocketbook is not a factor. I don't have a lot of patients like that, by the way. And for the most part, I doubt most of us do. But there are many times when it's very when it's abundantly clear that a patient's budget is going to influence the treatment plan that they accept today, right? I'll actually say to a patient, because it is the truth, I'll say, you know what's in my head right now? What's in my head are ways that I can make this for you. This, I, I can't just address one tooth for you. Not in your case, I can't. And so... There are way, I'm thinking in my head right now, how can I make this as conservative, which means less, and affordable for you, and still be responsible? Because it does no one any good for me to offer you an alternative treatment plan that simply is going to fail in, a, in six months from now because it was a lesser treatment plan. That doesn't work for anybody. I'm trying to give you end reels as I'm pausing. Okay? Yeah. You can have the whatever you want. I mean, uh, yeah, I think we got a lot. You know, we have a lot. I think we can uh, have a few uh, things and stuff here. Something that we wouldn't order in an office. Okay, I'm going to do one more. 40, close to 40 minutes. <laughs> okay. The last thing I'm going to talk about on this podcast is something I've talked about before. Time. How you schedule procedures. I know it's a little audacious for me to recommend to all of you to try for three months to add a little more time to all your procedures in a given day. That's something I did several years ago. And I'm going to tell you why. Because none of us think about it this way. I bet you if you go back and you examine the redos in your office, what am I talking about? Open contacts from direct restorations, open contact from laboratory restorations that you s overlooked. Um, any clinical mistake that you may have made and have to redo to preserve honor with that patient because it's clear that it was on you, almost all of them will be traced back to quick decision-making by you. Lack of time. Okay, And you could extend that to broken relationships with staff members in you. You can extend that to broken relationships with patients in you. That you just at that moment, in that very busy day that you were having, didn't have enough time to deal with it the way you knew you should have dealt with it. And I got to tell you, it's the best thing I ever did. And here's the thing. You're saying to yourself, oh my God, so I'm struggling right now to pay overhead, right? And now Rasner's recommending that I add time, which means I'll make less. You won't make less. You'll make more. You'll make more because you'll make less mistakes. You'll make more because you'll have peace of mind. You will. What you need to do 
is have a strategy early on. I mean, right now, to commit to CE the rest of your life so you can be so on your game that you can justify having fees where they're supposed to belong. Not the cheapest guy in town. Quite honestly, the opposite if you've earned it. And when you've earned it, you can add time to your procedures and enjoy this profession the way it's meant to be enjoyed. And I'll wrap it up now. So listen, guys. I feel funny sometimes doing these podcasts and doing the reels and all the things that you've seen in abundance in the last three months. I also have to say, I love it. I do. I love hearing from you. I love getting emails or comments, good and bad, mostly the good I like, all the good I like. Um, but I'll tell you, I don't have all the answers. What I see this is as, what I see this as, is part of my journey. I'm now into my fourth decade of practice, and I've made abundant mistakes that I know better of now that can help you in your practice that can help you not go down that road and save you time and money. It's really what it's about, sharing with you the knowledge that I've acquired. I never want to come off like a know-it-all because I don't know it all. I'm still out there myself, as you'll see in some of the reels coming up, taking CE. I don't just take CE once in a blue moon. It's an abundant part of my year. I'm lining up my courses right now. But I just want to get that back in your head because I'm not just some guy on Instagram. I'm a guy that really cares about my reputation, what I give to the profession, because I can never give back the, the, the amount that I've taken away, what I've gotten from being a dentist in the particular 44-year journey that I've had. It's, it's been good to me, and I want to give back.